Welcome, everybody, to another edition of A Conversation With here on the Severe MMA YouTube page. I am E. Spencer Kite, friendly neighborhood Spencer man, and I am joined by one of the best coaches in the business, Mr. Eric Nixick from Extreme Couture. Coach, this has been a long time coming. We've been, we've been circling this one for a little bit. We've had many a conversation over the last few years, but it's time, time for you to sit in the big chair. It's time to pour into your life. Thank you for doing this. How are you this morning? I'm I'm ready. I'm a little nervous now. Shit, you, you know, usually I, you know, I talk business, but this is good. I mean, we'll we'll still talk a little bit of business because we got to talk <laughs> about you know different fight stuff here and there. But the purpose of this show and and the reason it came to be was we only see so much of athletes, of coaches, of people involved in the sport, and we all contain multitudes. And there's more to all of us. Our journeys to these points, to where we intersect, are certainly different. And I want to explore some of those and present some of those to other people. But we always start the same way. We always start the same way. So Eric Nixick, when did you fall in love with combat sports? Uh, I think 93, you know, I was a young kid, VHS tapes. And, you know, it it was me and like five or six of my friends on the football team. And we'd always come to the house and hang out. And I was, I was always the guy popping in the VHS tapes and then, you know, one of my dear friends, he's one of my best men. We still talk to him today, Jeff Summers. I'm like, Jeff, let me try this move on you. Let me let me do this. Let me do that. And he hated my gut. So I, I was the quarterback and he was my center. So it was like a lot of ways it was like pecking order. It was like, no, dude, you're going to do this, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Throwing around that. No, I'm the captain. You're going to do this. Yeah, thing. exactly. My hands in your butt all day long. So you're going you're gonna to deal with, with uh, learning how to get Kimura and an arm bar and stuff like that. So, um, but as you know, like there wasn't, there wasn't anywhere to go learn that, especially at that age. And, um, you know, I remember like a Valley Tudo gym opening up kind of close to us in Green Valley, um, went under real quick. And then I think like the real like staple guy that came in was John Lewis. When John Lewis came to JSEC and opened up his gym out there, I don't remember the exact years, but I was still a pretty young kid. And uh, I, was, I was playing football, I was playing college ball. So I remember – like being able to go and like come during the off season, go to John Lewis's gym, just get my ass kicked, learn, train. And then, uh, you know, because of, because of like football and being on scholarship, you weren't allowed to do any of that stuff. So it wasn't until like, really, I got out of school that I, I try to like pursue it a little bit more and just learn. That's all. Only thing I was doing it for was just literally just to learn and have fun. And I think just be around, um, you know, like-minded individuals you know so that's kind of what got me into it so you threw a couple markers out there that people that that don't know where they signify may not be able to understand i've been around vegas enough i know when you're throwing out green valley and john lewis and all this you're vegas born and raised right this is yes sir this is hometown day one what's it like coming up in in vegas what what was vegas like for you growing up you you learn quick you know, you, you, you learn, <laughs> you learn, um, very mature things, um, at a very young age, you know, like things that I think that, you know, my dad, my dad was murdered when I was two years old. You know, he was, uh, he was, um, basically from Italy, came out here, help help move in drugs, you know? So my, my dad was killed when I was two years old. Um, I remember little bits of them because I remember like being kind of a traumatic, not traumatic, but like just some instances that were very, you know, very vivid to me as a kid, which is weird to think that I can remember things when I was two. Um, so when he was, he was killed, my mom remarried to my dad now. And, you know, he became that, that man for me, you know, he was, he was, I don't think of him any other way, but I actually remember like when my real dad was still alive, you know, uh, my mom and my mom and my real dad were separated and my, my dad now like come into the apartment and my real dad, like knocking on the door and I had to hide, hide my dad in the closet, you know? And cause my, my real dad would have killed right. him. You know what I mean? Right. So I remember that. I distinctly remember like putting, putting my, my dad now, my father knocking on the door, my, my dad now in the closet and putting stuffed animals on top of them and going like this, like be quiet. Right. Like crazy shit, crazy shit. So, you know, growing, growing up in Vegas and especially around like that, that mob lifestyle, you know, my mom, would have to like take me over to my grandparents' house until until my, my father would call and say I was safe to come home. You know, like crazy shit. 
crazy shit. My mom's got some crazy stories about, you know, that, that, that time in her life, you know? So, and she's born and raised out in Vegas too. So she's, she's really seen it all. And then, um, you know, at a, at a real young age, I mean, drugs, alcohol is very relevant, very in front of your face, especially in Vegas, 24 hour lifestyle. Your right. parents were working in casinos, um, you know, hustling and bustling. But I think you stumble across that at a very young age and you see it. So for me, I was, I think I was fortunate enough to be pretty disciplined in the regards of understanding that my real dad died because of drugs. So I never touched the shit. You know, I just, I just, I had to despise for it, you know? And, right. um, I was 13 when I saw one of my, my good friends get shot, shot and killed, you know, um, football player grew up fast, man. Guys, guys getting killed in DUI accidents, car accidents and things like that. So Vegas was a very fast lifestyle. Um, I had a fake ID when I was 16, you know, so you're going to clubs and doing everything up. So by the time you turn 21, you're like, shit, I'm over this. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. So, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was thinking now back to Spence is crazy. Like my daughter's 15 years old. Right. I, I think back like, <laughs> man, when I was 15, whew, I was into some shit, you know? Well, and, and Vegas has changed so much in it. So you and I are fairly close in age and like people that go to Vegas now, there is elements that can be family elements and it's not necessarily seedy, dirty, grimy Vegas that it was. But yeah. for a long time, Vegas was literally just, I mean, Sin City isn't the nickname without a reason. It was where you went to do all the shit that you couldn't do elsewhere or that you didn't want to do elsewhere. And it wasn't, oh, we're going to bring the family and we're going to have a lovely time and we're just going to sit at the pools and it's all going to be wonderful and tame. It was, it was rough and you didn't go unless you were looking for a little bit of trouble or a little bit of chaos. Oh, straight up dudes living separate lives, you know, right. people living a whole never their lives out here. You know, I knew guys coming up in the bar industry, customers that lived in other areas, but had a whole nother life. <laughs> you know, you saw, right. you saw it all. You know, and that was the other thing too, man. I was, you know, 21 years old, I was, I was learning how to bartend and I bartended for 20 years out here in Vegas. So understanding the nightlife, the customer service industry, you know, and being a part, I guess, of, of understanding what drugs, alcohol, and gambling really, really do to people, you know, and it's, it's playing with fire. That's the best way I can, I can put it. Like when a fighter comes to Vegas and they move from a different city and they come to Vegas, I tell them like when Kevin Lee moved out here from Detroit, I was like, we're going to find out real quick what you're all about. You're going right. to either be about this right. nightlife scene or you're going to be about training and, and being a good fighter because, you know, at the time, I mean, you can, you can get some good work in and, or you can get some good trouble in too, you know? Right. Yeah. I've, I've come up in both of those areas as well. The, the, the casino and bartending scenes and it has steered me away from both in my older age. And once I hit that point of like, yeah, no, this isn't fun anymore. This isn't, you just see too much. And as you said, you learn real quickly the downfalls of it. You mentioned um, scholarship football. Where'd you go to school? What'd you play? Why do we not know Eric Nixick as an NFL Hall of Famer? <laughs> well, yeah, so Green Valley kid. And, um, you know, my senior year, first team all state, third team all West Coast. Um, didn't really do well on, on a, any of my SATs and testing and things like that. We didn't get recruited a whole lot um, until senior year because – we didn't play really anybody like no one really knew about green Valley football. And then um, I think it was my junior year, our head coach decided to start playing some California schools and we started beating them. You know, we, started, we beat Castle Park, uh, Chula Vista and went out there and played them senior year. We beat Long Beach Poly. They're number two in the country that year. They had probably, I don't know, 20 NFL guys in that team ended up going to the NFL. We beat them at home 16 to 10 and uh, crazy Tupac died the next day. <laughs> so yeah kind of a nuts nuts weekend for us we beat long beach Poly and two pocket shot but uh yeah and then we played oceanside where um junior say i went and we lost to them on a hail mary and they were ranked in the country as well so what what happened was is like you start playing these teams and of course scouts were looking at these teams in particular and right. my dad my, my, my dad was our defense coordinator my dad's like man you got to flash on tape you got to you got to show these guys that you belong so the kid that was covering me against uh, Long Beach Poly, his name was Marquise Anderson. He went to UCLA. I had seven catches on him, a couple touchdowns. 
okay, well, guys are going to be looking at Marquise. They're going to look at you. All right, show out. Block hard. You know, I was playing receiver. Hey, block hard. Hit people. Don't be afraid of contact. And a lot of the tape I was putting out there was more of as me as a receiver was was me actually crack backing and blocking on dudes to where schools are coming out to me and say, hey, man, you're a safety. You know, you can catch the ball, but, man, you can crack. You can hit people. So, you know, that was that was really it for me, man. I just kept trying to put out good tape and then decided to go to Reno. Um, a couple of my friends are going to Reno. So I was like, oh, I'll go I'll go up to Reno. So I think I can go up there and play some good football. They, they spread the ball out. They threw the ball around. Um, you know, Wisconsin, Washington, some other places, you know, that it was like went up there for like camps, went up there to get some looks and things like that. But everybody wanted to play defense. Now, at the time, I was like, no, I, mean, I was like 175 pounds. I was like, no way. <laughs> Seven, you know, I'm not playing Big Ten football. And uh, right. you know, everybody was there. They're right. They're like, look, you're, you're young. I, was, I graduated at 17. Hey, we're going to redshirt you a year. We're going to put you in the weight training program. You're going to be 210, 220 by the time you're out of that redshirt year. And I know, hey, there's no way I'm going to be like, sure shit. 18 hits. I gained 30 pounds, you know. So I ended up going out to Utah playing ball at Dixie, Dixie Junior College play for back-to-back national championships, um, end up playing free safety, you know, had some good guys on the team, some good, like Corey Dillon was on our squad. He was a year, a couple years older than me. Berkman followed me up. Josh Berkman was on our squad. He played running back and Josh could ball, man. He was a good, good ball player, but you know, played, um, played there. And then, you know, for me, it was started to become more about my head trauma. I started understanding like, you know, back then you get your bell rung, but you didn't know what was wrong with you. Like I mean, no... just the, just the phrasing of that is is, I mean, it ages you and I, right? Of, of you know what "get your bell rung" means, and it's like, oh, you just yeah, fine, you got your bell rung, shake it off for a play or two, and then get back in there. Exactly. You you would. I mean, I remember knocking myself out, and then guys, I would see all white. I'd hit somebody, and I'd just go everything in flash white. I'd still be on my feet. I wouldn't be laying on the ground. I wouldn't be posturing or anything like that. But then they would like walk you back to the huddle and then your your eyesight would come back and then you go right back to the next play yeah that wasn't normal like we, you shouldn't have been doing that shit yep. you know and it was part of the game and that was part of something we dealt with over and over and over so um i remember we had a kid transfer from university of tennessee his name was eric lockhart he was our running back eric breaks off a, a play um and i go and like crack back on a guy i get pretty bad concussion that game it was like the next time out another one and another one and it was, I think it was actually ended up being a practice where I, I caught a ball and I like I went backwards and my head landed on the back of a guy's knee or kneecap, like got me in the back of the head. And I remember sitting in my dorm room or in my apartment and I sat in there, Spence, for, man, I, I say, I felt like it was like three days, man, all dark, all dark. Yeah. I remember really eating. I remember like the light turning on and like, I would just get nauseous. The biggest thing that I remember was um, I couldn't regulate my heat my temperature, I'd be freezing cold. I'd be sweating. I'd be freezing cold. I'd be sweating. And it was, you know, it was like mid September. So it's still kind of hot, you know, and I, I could not figure out what was wrong with me, but then all of a sudden it was this depression over and over and over to the point where it was like, you know, I didn't, I never really associated it to concussions until, I don't know, maybe five years after the fact, right. I knew like, I knew something was wrong with me and I knew like, I, I think this is it for me to play football. Um, you know, I, I could have gone to UNLV, finished up playing ball, but man, for some reason, why, I don't know what it was, man. I was just like, dude, I, I don't think I can keep playing like this, you know? And that was it for me. I came back home and, you know, uh, went back to school and was finishing up school here. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's would have been great if you could have continued playing and, and chase that dream. I'm glad selfishly, I'm glad you didn't, I'm glad you're here with us now yeah. and, and doing the things that you're doing. Um, family sporting history was was sports a thing like was that a you mentioned your your father was your defensive coordinator you and i have talked about his sort of thoughts on some athletes that are in the ufc and and mma these days of like well if it was 20 years ago they'd be doing this yeah was it was it a all the way through thing like that was that was your foundation that's sort of what what sets the tone for you as eventually become an athlete yourself and then a coach yeah, it was really all I knew in my youth. So um, my uncle, he kind of, you know, he, he kind of filled that father role for me as well. Um, he actually introduced my mom and dad now. So my uncle was a fucking hammer, hammer, linebacker, 
strength and conditioning guy, like hammer. And it was a great balance between, you know, my uncle and my dad. My dad's not necessarily soft spoken, but he's more cerebral. And where my uncle's like this fucking all day long, right? So I had my uncle David and I had my dad, both defensive minded coaches. And um, growing up, I mean, that was really it. So my dad came, from, my dad was from uh, Pittsburgh. He was a all, all American running back all of his family's lineage. My, my great uncle, um, Mike Nixon was the head coach for the, um, Washington Redskins coach for the Cleveland Browns as well. So it was, it it just ran through my, my, my dad's side of the family, you know, and my dad, they all wanted him to go to Pitt. He wanted to go to Penn state. He's on his recruiting trip to Penn state. He gets in a car accident, doesn't get to go on his trip. He ends up going to Texas, leaves, like leaves it all, goes to Texas instead. Just leaves the state. Screw this. I'm going. I'm out of here. So, um, blows his knee out pretty bad, but he falls into coaching. So he's coaching in, out in um, East Texas, and that's kind of where he makes a start. And then, um, you know, makes his way out to Vegas, and he's coaching at Valley High School. And that's – honestly, man, that's that's where, like, my fondest memories of growing up was on the football field with my dad. And then you have, you know, your uncle, and then you have all these other coaches that become your uncles, you know. Right. So yep. every summer – that was it, man. I was – I was they, everybody – I was Bubba. And Opie, that was my two <laughs> nicknames. And I was out there catching balls and, you know, playing the game and understanding the game. And then, you know, come football season where I really spent time bonding time with my dad was watching tape. You know, I remember sitting there plugging in the VHS tape with the old man. And then like, he'd have his yellow pad of paper and sit there and watch football. And then over time he'd say, Hey, I just want you to watch this, this player and what he does and chart it. Okay, so I start charting plays with my dad over and over and over, you know, and start looking for these repetitions and start understanding the game from the mental side of things. And I think that's where it really helped me transition to MMA, the tape study and everything else. Yeah, from, li- really little do you know all those years ago that you're building and building and building. It, it reminds exactly. me, um, I'm a big Inside the Actors Studio when it used to be a show that was on. Remember Jamie Foxx was on there once yeah. and, and and the host James Lipton is asking him about, oh, you went and did this for school. Cause he went to like prestigious international music school for piano yeah, and learning and learning and learning his grandmother very much push him into it. And he's like, and then all these years later, along comes this movie called Ray where they want <laughs> me to actually, where, where you actually have to, and it's really going to be beneficial and I can sit down. And I've got this thing from back here that I didn't know back then why I was doing it. Sounds like you have some, some similarities that you've been able to, to pull along with you. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, I always felt like I would end up in coaching at some capacity. Obviously I thought it was going to be football. When I got out of college, my uncle, uh, my uncle David was that ended up taking the head coaching job at El Dorado. He brought me on right away. He said, Hey, I want you to run the passing offense. You know, we're going to have two offense coordinators. You run the passing game. Uh, this guy run the running game. You'd be like co-coordinators. I'm like, great. Got out of school and started, started coaching with him. And we had a, we had a running back that was ended up being pretty good. His name was Steven Jackson. So yeah, he was all right. He was, he was okay. He was, a, he was pretty damn he was good. Solid. So he ran the ball a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not yeah. much of a passing game when Jax is in there. Pass it to him. <laughs> yeah. Pass it, pass it At him. most. That's right. You know? So, um, yeah, I got I got to cut my teeth a little bit in high school football and some coaching. And then, you know, he, um, he ended up moving over to Palo Verde, helped coach some of this stuff over at Palo Verde for a little while. Then they do the all-star teams and all-star games. They'd bring me in and let me coach a little bit. So it was fun. But I always thought that, that would kind of be where I fell into was in the football side of things. And then you're – you're home and, and you hear that Randy's open in a gym. And from what I understand, you are member number 001 at Extreme <laughs> Couture. You are yeah. the first guy in the door. The, yeah. the old card that probably doesn't exist anymore is laminated and says, Eric, number one. How did yeah. that come about? Well, is was, was a good friend of mine. Uh, him and I would go to like lift weights together and everything else, but we always challenge each other, man. And he's still a good friend to me to, to this day, but like we always try to find things to like get better at or, or to, to kind of expose ourselves to, you know? And he was the one that mentioned it. He's like, Hey, I heard Randy's opening up a gym. We could not find this place for the life of us. And, you know, this is back when you remember like sunset didn't go through 
You right. had to like drive down to Cater. You come make a big old loop. Yeah. Sure, so so now finding this place isn't that hard. Everybody no. kind of knows where it is. But like, I haven't been to Vegas in a while. But like, I remember some early trips where people were like, "Hey, we're gonna go here," and and you just think you're driving into the middle of nowhere. It's the same as the old <laughs> yeah. tough gym where you're just driving and you're like, there's no goddamn way yeah. that this is. And then you pull into like a commercial set of buildings and you're like, this can't be. And then you see the emblem and you're just like, so it is. They, I don't even think they had signage on the place yeah. at the time. I remember it was cold. I remember being freaking cold. I think it was like December and like coming inside. And then like they had, um, I was like joke is like an F 16 engine. And it was like, this thing was like just pumping heat and they barely had a roll door open. I was like, you guys are going to die of carbon monoxide poisoning here. Yeah. Somebody's going to get sick. Yeah. This is not, this is not a good idea, but um, it was Mike Pyle. Mike Pyle was literally the first guy to greet me. Um, Hey, we're not open yet. You know, but Mike was the kind of guy like looking back, Mike was like, Oh, you, you're a big, big 230 pound outside (laughs) linebacker. I'm going to beat your ass. But he was right. super nice about it, you know? He was right. like, oh, man, you should come train, yep. you know? And, and then that was it, man. I, I came in, and uh, he, I think he invited us back the next day for whatever practice it was. Got the living shit kicked out of me by Mike. It was all grappling, but it was like ground and pound and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, this is this is real life. Like, how is this dude who weighs, you know, fights at 170, probably weighs 190, but this dude is beating my ass. And there was nothing you could do about it. I was right. like, this is, this is not only humbling, but this is like, I, I've got to learn more about this stuff and it was the next day and the next day and the next day and um you know sure shit we opened the gym i think february 07 i think it was when we opened like officially opened and i was member number one man so yeah that that feeling you had and that sense you had of this is humbling but i need to learn more is sort of the like from my experience very limited as it is getting my ass handed to me but also just from talking to people that's the that's the push pull right that's the door of it you either get yeah. humbled and think i'm out i i want no part of this cuz i can't deal with it or it's i'm humbled god i can't wait to get back there tomorrow i've rolled a For little sure. little bit and the thing i say to everybody is it is the most frustrating enjoyable experience of my life and if I was ever not super busy and not super lazy, I would do it again and try to commit myself to it more because that, it, you know, right away that you're going to learn something, that it's going to teach you something. Maybe not the art itself, because you may continue to suck at that forever, Right. but you're going to learn some shit about yourself real quickly. And it sounds like 100%. you got, you got bit by the bug and that was it. And I mean, and to their, to their credit, they, you know, it's like they, they beat you up enough, but they wanted you still to come back and not like kill you, right? you know? And right. I think over time I understood once I got into the gym and understood the, 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 the dichotomy of what we dealt with in here, that they actually really do like you. Like all these, these guys, like Jay Heron took me under his wing right away. Right. Like guys that you see on a daily beat the living piss out of people. Right to where they don't want you to come back but guys <laughs> right. that are trying to take care of you and kind of you know foster you along and help you and, and help you grow i was very fortunate but i think a lot of that was my attitude like i wasn't coming in here thinking i was a badass and i still don't think that i don't think that at all i think that there's always going to be somebody out there that can mess you up and that was the mentality right. that i always kept and you know those guys really really took me under their wing and you know i see i just saw mike last week and every time i see mike it's just like that big brother vibe, you know, and, and I tell him all the time, like, bro, I'm not in this position today without you, whether he doesn't. And I know he doesn't think like that. Like right. I mean, he just thinks I'm just some, you know, this my little brother kind of thing, but I, I'm, I'm dead serious when I tell him that, bro, like my, a lot of my success is built off of you spending time with me and, and taking care of me. So as member number one, you're one of few people that has been there through sort of all the iterations of extreme couture. You mentioned Jay. Jay's one of them as well. And always shout outs to, to Jay here on the thoroughbred. Still haven't seen him win a fight in any of his acting roles, but he'll get there one day. <laughs> Poor he'll guy. get there one day. He'll, he'll get there one day. It's the it's the the stress of being a stunt man. Always get your ass kicked, even though you're the toughest guy on set. What has it been like progressing through those those eras and those iterations of different coaches, different personalities? 
ups and downs of the gym itself in terms of the athletes. How has it been navigating those very challenging waters? Because I'm sure there are times where somebody's in charge or there are coaches or people where it just doesn't vibe. It just doesn't mesh right. And you think, uh, maybe it's time to split. And then there's another shift. What's that? What's that all been like? It's like going to college, honestly, for me. And again, I was a fly on the wall. So learning and understanding and figuring out what went wrong in the times when like different eras of coaches were in here, different egos and personalities. And remember like this was at his infancy still like this, this fight game. So people were clamoring for the limelight. You know, they wanted to be the, 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 the coach that was on, you know, the countdown shows and, and they wanted to be the guy that was getting mic'd up and it was the guy on the stage. It was this whole thing. Like you just started to understand that it became a bigger business than what, you know, it was about just winning fights. And, I felt like that had a lot of clash with coaches here, um, especially young, like early guys, like, you know, the Tompkins era, like Sean, Sean ran this gym and, you know, and then there was Ron, you know, and then those guys kind of had their thing. Right. And not, not, I don't say beef, but like those guys kind of ran the mat and then Gil, Gil Martinez was in here. Um, and then of course, Randy, I think the biggest thing, the biggest shift that I saw to Spence was like when Randy retired yeah. and, Randy really held the room together and really kept things kind of the way, because everybody just followed on Randy. Like, okay, it's what his, is the yeah, it's his name do? on the wall. He is the tone setter. And when he's there regularly, routinely, that's the tone. And even if and he's not here today, he'll be here tomorrow. And that's going to be the tone for sure. And, and it, it was literally that mentality of like, everybody just looked it over at him. Like, all right, what are we doing right. with this? What does the boss want to do? Like, how, how are we going to run this today? Or what does the boss want to do? You know, so when he retired, um, looking back, I remember him kind of saying to Dennis, because he, he wanted Dennis to take over. And it was like this, um, hey, guys, I'm out of here. And I'm doing this because I know all of you guys are relying on me on a day-to-day -day basis, but I got other shit I want to do. So I love you guys. I'll be here, but figure it out. You know, so he, he really left it on Dennis's lap. And then um, about a year, I think, in, into Dennis's coaching, that's when Dennis and I went to um, Randy and said, hey, man, we would like to hire Robert Fallis. I think I think he would be a good, you know, partnership with the gym. Well, Randy and Robert, I wouldn't say we're on the best of terms from from the Team Quest days. He wasn't wasn't too sure about Robert, I think. And, and But me and Dennis were. We were sold on him. Like, we wanted to bring him in. And I think there are some personal issues between Robert and right. Randy. And he said, look, man, I love both of you guys like my sons. If you guys feel like this is what you want to do, I got your back 100%. But I think these are some of the pitfalls you might run into. Told us that well ahead of time. Okay, let's do it. You know, I, I, we believed in Robert. And Robert came in and he brought a certain sort of, I guess, clarity to practices. He brought a standard. And – you know, whether people agreed with like some of the things that he like this Tony Robbins speeches and things like that. I loved him. Some people didn't. Right. You know, but that's OK. Right. But the standard was what I cared about the most. And the nice thing about what Robert did was it wasn't Robert's standard. It wasn't my standard or Dennis's or anybody else's. We asked simply posed the question, like, what what do you guys want to be known for as an MMA gym? Me, you know, Misha wasn't at the gym yet. I think the only champions we had here were Forrest and Randy when he beat Sylvia. Um, so what do you guys want to become? Like, what do you want to do? And yeah. of course, everybody in the room, we want to be world champions. We want to get back to that. That He's like, great. I'm glad you guys all said that. And we started to impose these standards as a team. Like, right. Well, well, here's what it takes. Here's what it takes. And, you know, I remember him going over like the showing up on time thing. And a lot of guys didn't really like, ah, whatever, five minutes late. And But Robert always had a way to back it, almost like scientifically or with like numbers or with, you know, hey, listen, and I still use that to, to this day. Five minutes late, 20 reps. That's how many reps you miss out on. If you're five minutes late, five days a week, an eight-week camp, you do the math, right? And you're like, oh, shit, was that eight, 900 reps? 
He's like, yeah, so you miss out on all of these reps in an eight-week camp because you decided to be five minutes late. So when you're when you when you lose a split decision or you lose a close fight, right, right, there's those reps. The, there's those reps, you know. And then we took it a step further. We call them crumbs. Like we're not going to leave any crumbs behind. I tell that to Danny Ige all the time. No crumbs. Clear your plate. Clear your plate. You know. And that that became our our kind of mentality. So when you know, obviously when Robert came in, the standard began to change, and we started to fucking win. You know, and guys started believing that system. You know, so when he passed away. I think that was the the one thing I said in the meeting when Robert passed. I said, "Hey, we're going to keep that standard, and we're going to keep the standard the same way, in honor of his memory." And this is what he would expect out of us. You know, we have the big you know portrait of him on the wall. We got to think that he's watching us every day, and we got to keep that standard the same no matter what. When I'm gone, when Dennis is gone, whatever that standard remains the same for for everybody here, and, and that's the way we're going to run our run our gym. So seeing like kind of all of these like different personalities and coaches and egos and the this and the that as a young kid coming up, I think it really helped me understand, like, I guess the ideology of who and what we need to become here at Extreme Couture. And I needed that. Like, it was like literally going to fucking college and now right. full going circle, to coaching college. Yeah. Going to coaching college. What does this guy do? Great. What does this guy do wrong? And at the time, too, Spence, like, the interesting thing was everybody was a specialty coach, right? It was like, right. you had to, you, this guy was his Somebody was boxing, this guy was, somebody was this, he, somebody was... Yep, yep, everybody had their little thing. And it was it was Ray, when I ran Ray's camp, um, you know, I was helping out Ray with some of the grappling, some of the wrestling stuff, and then Dewey Cooper came in and helped with some of the striking stuff. And it was, that's when it kind of dawned on me, it's like, dude, I got to learn all of this. I got to learn all of this stuff. Right. And I, I started bugging Ray. I was like, Hey, I want to learn a whole, a whole pads for you. And Ray's like, all right, be here Tuesday, Thursday, 10 AM every day. I was there holding right. pads for Ray Seffo. So the first guy I ever really held pads for was six time world champion K1 kickboxer, you know? And I understood that. Okay. If I can go on the road with my fighter at a young age, a guy on a regional scene, he doesn't have to pay for a boxing coach and a grappling coach. Right. This. Learn how to hold pads, learn how to grapple, learn how to wrap hands, do all these things because you're going to be more valuable to a fighter when he can only has to take one, one, one guy, one coach, right. you know, and that's kind of what I started doing. Showing up to amateur practice, corner and corner and amateur fighters. I remember Dennis going to show up to amateur team. I want you to just corner fighters during sparring. And I would do that over and over and over and over, and over. try to perfect your craft get the proper reps because we wanted to eliminate the idea of the specialty coach that we're all MMA guys. You mentioned him in there and, and he's in the picture hanging behind you. Why does Dewey Cooper hate the right sleeve of, of all shirts? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, bro. That's his thing. I'll be, I'll be like, yo, we gotta go. I mean, if I had guns, if I had those guns oh, at his dude, age, I would good. still be showing them off too, but it's pretty oh. impressive that anytime you see Dewey Cooper, that right arm is just, it's fully, it's fully out there and it's usually up. It's usually up until Dude. we get to the corner. Oh, that's my guy, bro. He cracks me up. Like <laughs> I remember Kevin, Kevin Lee, like struggling to make weight when we were fighting uh, Barboza. I'm like, Dewey, I need help, man. And dude's over here still rolling up his sleeve and shit. Like doing his thing in the rear. I was like, this guy's like, won't even. And, and I'm like, coach i got i need to fucking help you with this thing dude but man he's he's cool shit bro my guy he is he is he's a good dude you mentioned there obviously the the influence of Fallis, the passing of robert Fallis. there's a great chronicle episode on ufc fight pass about yeah. sort of his influence and everything that that he meant to fighters in vegas and and specifically the gym i want to commend you guys and and i don't think you and i have had this conversation I want to commend you guys on on just how incredible you've done over these last several years to maintain and build extreme couture in the wake of something incredibly traumatic that could yeah. have been a point where everything just goes hey and this is when the gym just just stopped man because it's and it yeah. would be understandable right i've talked to a bunch of your athletes about it about the impact of it. Some of them that have said like, I was 
I was two years before I could really listen to anybody and give a shit anymore. Cause that was my guy. Yep. And you guys have kept it all together and flourished. So please take pride in that. Give that, pass that along for me to yeah, the rest of sure. your coaching staff, the rest of your team. It is, it is incredible to see. And it's, it's admirable to see because every one of you lost somebody deeply close to you. And yet you celebrated him. You took his, his directions and said, yeah. let's, let's do this for him. Not right. let's let this ruin us. And that's, that's yeah, I mean, a big that's, thing, man. No, I appreciate that, man. And that was, that was our only choice. It was grab yourself by the bootstraps and get back to work because that's what I mean. It's not you and I know it's not, it's, it's, yeah. it's the only choice that you're going to make and that those athletes right. are going to make. But I'm sure there were right. also some people that, that went, no, I can't, I can't fucking do this anymore. Yeah, no, you're right. And it was, it was a, it was a tough transition there, man, because you know, the last, probably the last nine months of when Falls was alive, there was a lot of turmoil you yep. know, between myself and Ryan and Randy um, and, and Robert and even like Dennis, like a lot of the team guys, like, you know, Robert, Robert kind of went down this dark path for a while there, you know, and it was, it was hard for all of us because we were trying to steer him in the back, back in the right direction. And um, you know, there was just a lot of characteristic things that started to come about with him that just weren't, it wasn't him it just wasn't him that's the only way i can put it like it wasn't a guy that i know and love so you know when he passed away i think there was a lot of like you know guilt resentment there was so many different emotions that that hit us all um but it was about a year maybe a little less i had this really really crazy dream man and he came to my dream and he's like clear and bright and vivid and like everything about him was like oh he's okay like he's where he belongs and he's in this great space and this like emotion, like lift off, lifted off to me. Like I remember waking up like tears and it was, it was a fight week and I don't remember who was fighting, but I'm like, dude, he's here. Might've been Joe. It might've been Benavidez. Like, so, like it was like something that was like very connected and I'm like, okay, he's good. Like I, I, I feel that. And then, um, you know, I, I still, I still stay in contact with Rick, his brother, and in a lot of ways for me, man, like talking to Rick is, is just like talking to Robert. I mean, it really is. Even the mannerisms, the voice, the way he thinks is like, man, I still have a connection to Robert and vice versa. You know, I hear from Rick probably once a week and man, it's, it's, it's really great to have that relationship with him. But no, like you said, man, like we really didn't have a choice and we did, but our mentality was, man, like, here's how we're going to remember Robert is we're going to, we're going to go out there and we're going to do the things that he all like, he, he believed in me Spence in ways that I never believed in myself. <laughs> I mean, he did, right. man. Like yeah. I remember being on the road with him and he's like, dude, I'm telling you, bro, you're the next one up. You're the one he goes, the, your leadership capabilities. He goes, I never forget this. He's like your leadership and the way you carry yourself and all these things. One day your skills are going to catch up to that. He goes, you're going to far surpass all these people. And I'm like, no way, no way, no way. So like, dude, I'm telling you, man, like you have it. And I never really believed that. And until he started, you know, kind of ingrained that into me. And then like the moment I said that in the piece, in the UFC piece, like the moment I won coach of the year, I called Rick. He was the first guy I called. I was like, I didn't call my wife. I didn't call my mom. Nobody I called Rick Fallis. I said, Hey, we, we fucking did it, bro. Like, like remember that shit Robert used to say, he's like, yep. I won coach of the year. He's like, no fucking way, bro. That's awesome. So like being able to share that moment with him was almost like me calling Robert. Yeah. Meanwhile, Annie's like, what the fuck, man? You calling somebody else instead of me. I'm the no, one I'm putting up that. with your shit. I'm the one putting up with your shit all the time. No, that's why she loves me. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the rapport with him and your leadership style. You have an insane rapport with all of your athletes, but it is certainly different. The relationship with each guy, as I think it needs to be for coaches. How do you foster those different relationships with and we'll just throw a few names out here sean strickland punahele soriano who are diametrically opposed middleweights yeah and then a guy like Ige, who you also have a great relationship with where all three of those are very different relationships very different styles what are your sort of i guess key tenants to figuring out how to build that bond with each of them 
Yeah. So it's kind of funny. My dad would always have this analogy. He'd always say that, like janitor keys. It's like, you know, you walk down the hallway and the janitor's got his big ball of keys. He's like, but those keys open up right. a bunch of different doors. Right. And he knows he which said, doors. He knows which doors. And he said, you're, you, you're going to have to try a couple different keys. And sometimes you're going to be able to connect to, with certain guys and certain things. But the one thing that like I always remembered was stay true to who you are and your foundation, right? Like I'm not going to allow Sean to say something racist and, and say like, that's not going to happen. And he's not that guy anyway. But my point is, is that like, Hey man, you want to say whatever you want to say, but don't cross these fucking lines. Right. Right. Don't, don't put us, right. don't put us in, in, in bad light. And, and he's, and he, and he still, he toes that line constantly. Whereas like Dan Ige, he's a consummate like professional in everything that he does and the things that he says. So there's, there's more life coaching. I think when it goes, when it comes to Sean rather than like systematic MMA. Right. And I feel like over the years, especially in the room, I wouldn't say in public, I wouldn't say like what he did on aerial. I was like, Sean, like that was, that was garbage. You know, like that was garbage. Really? Not so like, yeah, dude, it was, it was cringy and it was garbage. And especially a guy like I respect Ariel, you know, and you're talking about his kids and you know, whatever else. So there's still, there's still that coaching dynamic that goes on. I think when right. in a personal light, um, but in the gym, in the room, all the things that I ever asked of him, man, like he, he listens and he takes it with a grain of salt. Like he used to be late for every practice. Do the dude's 30 minutes early now. He understands the importance of being on time. Well, dude, I mean, he, he, came, he came to you because he couldn't be anywhere else. He landed True. at extreme because everyone else was like, nah, man, no, Get the, the door's out. closed. Yeah. Literally the only guy that Dan Henderson's ever called me on and be like, don't have this guy in the gym. <laughs> Dan's like, this guy's a problem, you know? Yeah. And I was like, all right, thanks. Thanks. You know? And I, I love the Hendo. Like he's, he's a, I'm my favorite fighter of all time. So when Dan calls you, you know, he tells you something, it's you're going to listen. You're going to listen. And um, you know, Sean was, Sean was that project. And I just said, look, man, here's the things we won't waver on if you can follow these things and, and stay in line with what we ask. What well, I remember him showing up late for practice one day and no one wanted to spar him. It wasn't that no one wanted to spar him. Everybody already had their rounds lined up. So he shows up at three forty and he's like going off that no one, no, he has no rounds. I said, let me ask you a question, bro. Whose fault is it that you have no rounds? Is it my fault or is it your fault that you're 10 minutes late? He's like, yep, that's my fault. I go, so start taking accountability to your own career. Stop blaming other fucking people when you don't have rounds lined up. If you got yeah. here on time, you would have had rounds lined up. That's all it took was one time. And you guys, 30 minutes early. He's riding guys the night before. Hey, man, can we get my rounds lined up? You know, and I go, there you go. Now you understand the reasons why we do shit. Yeah, there's there's a public version of Sean Strickland. And I think there's a not a, a, not in front of the camera version of Sean Strickland. You know that you and I have had some conversations about it. I've written about Sean a bunch of times, had many conversations with him, have never minced my words with him that I think he's just a, a guy that needs some love and some guidance and some direction. And when he gets a little bit of that, he'll be, he'll be better for life and for himself. And I think we're seeing it come through because showed up on four days notice and, and beat Nasruddin Imavov, which is a pretty, pretty tall order and a tough ask, and and he handled it with with great, great, great ease. Yeah, and and to his credit, that's because he was being a good teammate. Right. The moment the moment he lost to to um, Cannoneer, back in the gym four days later, because Brad Puna, all these guys had fights it's because I had to be back right. and help out my teammates, you know. And to his credit, that's the reason why he was able to take that fight. For sure. Another thing you and I have touched on in the past and that I know is important to you is surrounding yourself with good people, the right people, good mentors. So yeah. for you, what is, what is a good mentor? What makes a good mentor, both in terms of the people that are mentors for you and you wanting to be a mentor to others? Honesty in the fact that like, you are comfortable enough to say something that might hurt their feelings. And like, I get that a lot from Dean. So Dean Thomas will tell me something and it's because he wants to see me be better. It's not to hurt your feelings. It's not to drag you down. And 
I appreciate that more than anything in this field because I know coaches talk shit behind your back and they'll <laughs> write to your face. They're the nicest guys in the world. They're all about high fives and hugs, but the Henry hoofs of the world, they'll tell you, man, to your face, Hey, I think you should do this or this or this. Right. I talk to Dean Thomas pretty regularly and I talk to Dean because I know he's not going to lie to me about something. When we lost uh, the fight to Josh Emmett, I called Dean right away. Hey, man, what could we have done better there? Well, you could have done X, Y, and Z. And I don't think of that as like he's going to hurt my ego. I think of that as like this guy cares enough about me to say the things that might hurt my feelings, but he wants to see me become better. So in this game, I feel like you really need to have that, man. I, I really feel like you need to have people that – love you and care about you enough, not only in this fight game, in, yeah. in your relationships, in anything, in anything like, you know, I, I can't remember the saying, but it was like, I love you too much to leave you the way that you are. Right. Like I, I'm not just going to keep telling you that you're doing something when you're great, when you're not right. I have a, I have a friend that was severely overweight and you know, I, I checked them. I was like, bro, you're going to die. Like you're diabetic. You have, you have two kids now you have this, you have that he lost over 200 pounds, right? Like he, he trains here every day. He, he's in better shape than a lot of guys in our room. I said, listen, I have the ability to give you a free membership. I have that ability. You have to show up. I care enough about you to tell you that you, you're going to fucking die. You look like shit. And he tells me that all the time. Every time I see him, he's like, dude, you changed, you saved my life. I'm like, no, nope, you saved your life. You're the one. I just that put gave you a world. push. Yeah. I just gave you a push. And there's, there's guys like that in, in, in the coaching realm that I love and respect so much that when they say something, man, I fucking listen. And it's important to have that. It's important to be able to pick up the phone and go, hey, man, what did I do wrong there? Or what, do you, what, what, what could I have done better? And they're, they're comfortable enough in, their, in your relationship to tell you what, what you need. And, man, I, 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 just, I, I feel like we all kind of need that. Yeah, it's certainly, I'm glad you mentioned like not just in this game and not just in coaching. It's, it's a life thing. You got to have people in your life that are certainly looking out for your best interest and to help you improve. And as you said, sometimes that's through hard things. Sometimes yeah. that's through hearing things you don't want to hear. Sometimes it's through criticism. One of the things I've always said is anytime anybody reaches out to me, I will respond because I'm only here because people listened to me and responded to me when I reached out and was like, Hey, can I get some advice? Can I get some direction? So anybody that needs it now, who am I to say no? Cause if they had said no to me, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. And my, my aim, if I'm a mentor to anybody is for them to surpass me and be better than me and grow beyond anything I can possibly be because then it means I succeeded. It's 100%. not, it's, it's not a detriment to me that, oh, this guy got better than me and, and can go, doesn't really need me <clears throat> in your instance. Somebody doesn't need you in their corner anymore, let's say, because they've, they've grown to bigger and better. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. I have nothing left to teach you is, is a good right. thing. It yeah. means they've figured it out. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, you, you see that, especially in, in the MMA field that, I think that's why I'm so open to, you know, guys tr cross training, like, you know, Hey Dan, go train with Trevor, like right. great friend of mine. And I love the fact that guys, guys feel comfortable to go out and get, get more work. But at the end of the day, like for me as a coach, it, it, it makes you want to continue to grow and continue to get better and hone your craft and become the best version of yourself day in and day out, because this game is constantly evolving and constantly changing. That if you don't stay on that cutting edge of things, you are going to get surpassed. So that's always been my mentality when it came to the coaching game is like, no, you got to get yourself out there and learn. You got to get yourself out there and, and try to become better. And that goes for the fighters as well. But you have to allow, let's say allow. Like I know guys are like, don't let guys go train at other places. You that's what I was going to say. Let's, yeah. Let's drill down on that a little bit. Cause it's, it's a very, it feels like a very divisive thing. There are some people yeah. that it's like, and I mean, look, the one that is always going to stand out for everybody and he stands out now because he's training in your gym. Is Cody Garbrandt calling TJ a snake? All of this stuff. Cody has now. I and listen, I've known Cody for a long time. I think a part of it is Cody has now grown up. Cody is now yeah. 
been in the game and realized, listen, you got to go. I've got to go train with Mark Henry. I've got to go hit mitts with GIF. I've got to go and learn from Eric. I've got to get these different looks. I can still be alpha male. I can still be, that can still be my, my family, my, the people I was with to start, but I'm only going to get better if I do these things. But it seems like a very divisive thing. You, you are certainly open to everybody spreading their wings and go get your looks where you need to get them. Why is it such a, in your opinion, is it such a divisive thing to some people that you go and and learn from somebody else? Well, I think it's a, I think it becomes an ego thing. You know, I really do. I, I think it, it it hurts it hurts somebody's ego when a guy's like, well, you know, I, I got to go get a, a look somewhere else, or I got to, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's not even that. Sometimes like I'm just gonna go travel. And go get some right. cross training in, you know, and, and and guys guys get mad at that. To me, it's just it doesn't make any sense. I'll tell guys like, hey, whatever you're learning, like when, when Dan went out with Cejudo, hey, bring it back. Like I want to learn. Tell me right. what you're doing. You know, you got it. You got to You got to expand on some of that stuff, and let's let's get better in those areas. You know, and I'll, I'll case in point, like um, Johnny Eblen comes out and trains with us all the time, right? We're not singing from the rooftops that Johnny Eblen's our guy. Right. That's King right. Lowe's guy and Mike Brown. Those guys, that, that that's his guys. Right. But look, he gets to come out and, and, and spar with new, new bodies and get some different looks and get some different coaching. And to his credit, it's made him better. You know, he's right. able to go do those things and, and credit to those guys at ATT because they don't care. They're like, yeah, go out there, go get some good looks, go out there and train and look what it does. Those guys, we, 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 we're happy for, for Johnny, but at the end of the day, he's out there winning his fights and he's doing all the right things. So, I think it's important, man. I think it's important to go out and get looks and change that coaching up every once in a while. Maybe it's not the corner, you know, maybe it's just go out and get some different looks. That's all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, and to me, it's always been weird because at the end of the day, it reflects positively on. So in your, in, in your case, well, you're here, you are my guest on this program. It, it reflects well on you that Ige goes out, trains with Trevor, get some, get some different looks, learn some stuff, comes back and has that performance that he had last time out. He's still your guy. Your guy got right. better. Your yeah. guy, extreme couture got a win. Yeah. What, what's All the downside the here? The At the end exactly. of the day, it's about that athlete, not the name on the wall, not you, Yeah. but that athlete and, and overall the team success always For kind sure. of made sense to me to, to get those looks. So weird and, when, and then when your, guys the mentality aren't is them. you're you're putting your athlete uh you know in front of you you're putting the athlete first and foremost and allowing them to go out and get the things that they need and whatever whatever it may be and sometimes too I'll tell you what Spence, they, like they come back and go bro i'm glad to be here I'm glad to be home you know sometimes <laughs> right. the shit's not always yeah. greener on the other side yeah you know? and, and, and well and that's that's an important thing too right sometimes you got to let people spread those wings and kind of take a few steps and be like you can come back when, when you realize yeah, that back, this is a good spot home. to be. Yeah. Yeah. Let's switch this up a little bit. You are a family man. You mentioned your, your daughter. You have a couple kids, a couple dogs, beautiful wife, beautiful family. <laughs> How do you, and, and I will say anybody that follows you on Instagram knows this anyways, but you do a very good job from what I see. Maybe Mrs. Nick sick will say otherwise. Maybe the kids will say <laughs> otherwise of making time for family time and, and being very committed to no, no, it's family time. I reached out to set this up and you were like, yep, cool. But let's talk about it Sunday night. Let's hit me up Sunday evening. I got shit going on Sunday evening. How do you, how, why is that so important to you? First and foremost, how do you then maintain it? Because I know from doing this and speaking to athletes and coaches and even just personally, it's a really hard thing to do and you do a really good job of it from what I see. I appreciate you. Um, it's a daily battle. And, and the, the, the one thing I can say, it's like, you know, your body's always trying to be a home in a homeostasis state. And it's almost like that's the balance every day that we're just trying to be in the middle of whatever we can do. Um, but it was really Teddy Atlas, man. And I've said this numerous times, like the first time I met Teddy Atlas, I mean, he's a, a legend and, and an idol of mine. And I shake the man's hand first time I ever met him. And he goes, Hey, I know you kid. 
how much, how many guys are you coaching right now? And I was like, ah, oh, I don't know, like 30. So he's like, no, way too many. Cut that in half. And he just started talking about family the whole time. Didn't talk about a technique. Didn't talk about anything that had to do with boxing or striking or, or MMA. We talked about family. And it was like the meeting your idol for 15, 20 minutes. And he went on and on and on about his experiences. Not the thing you thought you would talk about. <laughs> And it, bro, it was, and, but it's, it's crazy because it was what I needed to hear the most, you know, it was what I needed to hear the most. I can call him now and ask him, Hey, you know, about a technique and we had that right. relationship, but it was so cool because I just felt like it was what he felt I needed to hear at that moment. Like he saw right through me and he's like, Hey man, you know, my son's a scout for the Raiders. Uh, I missed his entire childhood. I did this, I did this, I did this. And now I'm making up for lost time. You know, he, he just talked about like um, the analogy he gave me was uh, the buckets. And he was like, hey, every facet of your life is like a bucket. And he goes, and they all command a certain amount of water, but you're only given one cup of water a day and that's 24 hours, right? So every time you're pouring a little bit of water, mind your bucket and see how much water's one's overflowing. Well, you're missing out on the family time. You're missing out on your faith. You're missing out on this. So just think about that every day as a kind of a, of a visual tool. And I do, I think about it. I think about it all the time. And I think having my wife is a great resource because she is the front lines, the boots on the ground, right? I'm the Pentagon. So she's, <laughs> she's, 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 she's on the ground, man. She's the one taking the fucking gunfire day in and day out. So when she tells me something, I take that as like, okay, I need to bring in air support or I need help. I need, she needs something, right? Whether it's taking one-on-one daddy daughter dates, you know, 15, 13 and six, right? Two girls in high school and junior high or high school and junior high. And there's a lot going on there where it's like the emotions and the this and that. So it's like, okay, this, this daughter has flag football tonight. I'm going to pick her up. I'll take her to dinner, get that one-on-one time and be present, man. It's like, get off your phone. And I, and, and I'm not great at either. And I, I, I tell myself that can wait. That little one-on-one time is the opportunity for her or them to bring up something going on in their life that maybe they weren't comfortable saying, Hey, put down your phone, get off your TikTok, kids, talk to dad, you know? And, and it, I feel like it's helped a lot as far as like the balance goes, but the quality quality of reps right like we're gonna go to the football game tomorrow hey get off your phones we're all gonna sit together we're gonna hang out we're gonna just spend time as a family but it's every day it really is man there's no there's no like good way to say like there's a schedule for it or anything like that it's um you know now i'm taking annie to dublin with me when we go and jeremy kennedy goes and fights all right i have this opportunity babe i've never been to dublin you fly for free her mom is a former flight attendant think you can get on that flight. So now these work trips become a little bit more family oriented now. And I get to spend time with my wife. So before it was always like fight mode, fight mode, fight mode. Right. Like to the day now, Spence is like, man, like I'm losing out on this time, you know? And it, it pains me like watching my son play flag football from the phone. Like it hurt, it hurts, but I get like that. That's the balance of fight the fight game. And Pick, the thing that stood with me the most about Teddy, he said, make sure your fighters understand what you're giving away. Make sure that they understand the time and effort that, that is being taken away from your family, that they reciprocate that back monetarily. They reciprocate that back with love and attention. And they, they, they get it, you know, Ige, Francis, like these guys, they get it. And they know, like, and they take care of you for that. And it, that's where I think where it becomes important that when your fighters really understand what you're sacrificing, what your family sacrifices by having a good coach, that they're the ones that suffer the most. And, you know, it'd be, it, it's, it's something that I think you're just never going to really find a great balance for, but you just got to fight, man. It's a daily battle with that stuff. Sean Sheehan here will tell you that Dublin is not the place to go in Ireland. I will tell you that you can find some good times in Ireland. I have been. I will get the boys here at Severe <laughs> MMA to to put together some some recommendations for when you guys go over with JBC to get that victory in Dublin. 
have any boys come to the house yet that have needed the, oh, just so happens that Uncle Francis is here and Uncle Jay Huron's here. <coughs> Maybe you recognize this gentleman as the UFC heavyweight champion. He really loves my daughter. Any of that Not, yet? Or are we, are we good so far? It's uh, it, it, as of late, it's been, it's been dad's Instagram, which has been pretty funny. So okay. she called me, she called me last week. Like, I don't know. I, I, I was like, I thought, I thought something was wrong. I was like, what's up? And she's like, Oh, there's, I can hear some boys in the background. And they're like, um, you know, what do you think? Uh, Sean, uh, 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 sugar Sean O'Malley, or what do you think of this guy? What do you think? I'm like, who are these boys? You know, they're like, they're stalking your Instagram. They want to know about X, Y, and Z. So, <laughs> right. they, they, so they, they know, know what dad does. They know what they dad know. does. And the, you, right. know, the, the, you know, the show of force if it has to happen. But there, at the end of the day, yeah, Francis would be the first one to open the door for sure. There's some there's some name brand insulation there. There's not a lot of Nick Six out there where it's like, wait, Nick Six in <laughs> Vegas. Yeah. Right. Dad, yeah. dad might be that dude that knows a bunch of fighters. Yeah. Yeah. He might be that guy. Yeah. And how is Francis Ngannou's best friend, Knox Nixick? Oh, he's loving life, man. He's, he's, uh, he's, it, it's so cute to kind of watch him and like him understanding like, right, right now with football, um, the, the growth of, of hard work, you know, and he gets it. Like he's starting to get it at a very young age. Like he'll go out back and, you know, he couldn't throw a spiral. I bought him one of those football nets, you know, and go out there and throw the ball with him. And I like throwing the ball. So I'll be out there with him throwing the ball. And I mean, he'll be out there hitting his reps over and over and over. And all of a sudden this kid's got a fucking cannon and he's throwing tight spirals <laughs> at six years old. Right. So, you know, last, last season, you know, coach Nick Sick coaching flag football. I was running the score up on kids, but you know, running RPOs <laughs> and. Oh, I've uh, seen referee, the videos. They're great. Yeah, The referee looks at me and he's like, dude, not only have I never seen five-year-olds throw touchdown passes, I've never seen five-year-olds throw three touchdown passes in one game. And I was like, yo, man, I'm trying to run the score up on these kids, you know? So he's out there working, and um, he loves the sport. He loves – Doing his pull-ups I, every day. Oh, hits his pull-ups, he, you know. And, I'll, and look, it's one of those things like you and I were talking about earlier with coming up and coaching with my dad. My dad's like, look, I'm not going to force you to do anything you don't want to do. If you want to be, um, you know, a video game player, you want to do this, you want to do this, I'm going to support you 110%. But whatever you decide to do, if it's football, I'm going to coach the shit out of you. <laughs> I'm going to coach the shit out of you. And you're going to be fucking, you're going to be, if you're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And that's the same, same thing with my son. It's like, look, if you want to be good at this sport, I'm going to give you the tools, the proper tools right. on how we can be good. And that's the thing that clicked. Like the first year of football, it was, you know, of, of course you're unsure. You don't know and contact and this and that. Start putting footwork drills together for him, throwing the football, the pull-ups, the push-ups, the running with the bands, all this stuff. The next season, he's scoring three touchdowns a game. He's starting to see it, starting to, starting to put it all together. So what happens is, is he knows that the hard work that he's putting in is reciprocating on the football field. Right. So what does he want to do? Comes home. Hey, Let's dad, work hard. throw the ball. Let's work. I'm in. I want to work. All right. I'll be outside with you. You'll be dead tired trying to cook dinner. You just got done holding pads for Francis or whatever else. <laughs> Little man wants to work. You're going to work with him. Yeah, for sure. I'll let you go on a couple quick hitters. You mentioned Dan sure. Henderson is your is your favorite fighter of all time. It's your favorite fight of all time. Doesn't have to be one that you cornered. Doesn't have to be one of your guys. But your favorite fight. It's, it's uh, Shogun and Dan in San Jose. That fight was wild. And I think what was crazy about it was I remember looking at Vinny because I was with Vinny that, that, and a camp was on the car too. Martin fought Rick story. Um, I thought the fight was over. I thought it was three rounds. It ended up being a fucking five rounder. <laughs> like, Oh shit. There's two more rounds of this. Right. And uh, yeah, man, like that, that one definitely stands out to me as far as like being a fan and being there and watching like, Oh bro, that was, that one was wild. Great, great fight and a great night of MMA. Same night as as Chandler and, and Eddie Alvarez in Bellator. Crazy right. night of fights. Yeah. Crazy night of fights, man. That one, that one always kind of stood out to me, I think, just because of like, you know, be, being Dan and and uh, yep. being there and being able to see it live. I mean, it's, it was, a, it's a hell of a fight. Hell it's of a hell fight. of a fight. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen that fight, go look it up. I believe it's UFC like one. Oh, I think it was just a fight night. It's it's not an actual 
numbered pay per view. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm gonna have to pull it up. My name, yeah. my my brain wants to say one thirty nine for some reason, but go You're look at Dan right Henderson show. Dan Henderson Shogun who a part one in San Jose happened the same night as Michael Chandler and Eddie Eddie Alvarez in Bellator. It was a massive night of crazy ass fights. Barn burner. Most frustrating coaching moment for you in your career. Don't have to name names, but what's what's been the most frustrating? And then we'll end it with what's been the most gratifying. Um, I think situational awareness things that come up in fights when we know better, you know, like, Hey man, we know better not to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the, the one that like, I think that still haunts me is, is Sean versus Perea. You know, it's like, Hey, we worked really hard that whole camp to wrestle. Um, to the point where Sean was taking down Ankalaev and was is scoring good takedowns and doing all the right things, um, against a guy who's a, you know, pretty good wrestler. Five pound, pretty good wrestler. Um, so that one, that one's going to bother me a little bit because I think we let one get away, you know, that those kind of things. Um, and, and, in fights where it's like, we know better the, with the routes or we know better in this situation. And we got, we got not necessarily out coached, but we should have been doing something better. And th- those ones will always kind of haunt right. me, I think in certain ways. Um, my favorite one, you know, I would say, Probably Francis Stipe. That one comes to mind just as far as like pure execution. Um, time put in, you know, I think for me was placement of, of every little thing that we talked about. And it all worked. Like everything was firing on all cylinders, man. It was nice to get him on the stool. Like I never had him on the stool in like three fights. You know, it's like this guy just right. killed everybody. And it was nice to be able just to like, sit him down and like i think that was the first thing i said to him after round one i was like oh dude it's nice it's nice, nice to see, see you here. yeah yeah he's like oh yeah this is kind of cool you know and, and yeah uh, i remember you and was- i you and i spoke before it and it was one of those ones where it was like it was pretty early on into us us having a relationship and i i knew there was a little bit of like i can't tell this guy too much because I don't, I don't know him that well yet but like yeah. got the sense of like oh everything's figured out they're yeah. We're gonna see. We're gonna see some shit when this guy goes out there, and sure yeah. enough, he went out there and and showed us, answered all the questions, and then some. Yeah, that was that. That to me was. I mean, I think just with everything that was with him losing the first fight, you know, and and fixing, trying to fix the holes, you know, and doing the things, the best things that we knew how, um, and really the 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 pandemic was was kind of what me made me and him so damn close you know and yeah. i actually had some pictures i just stumbled across it was just me randy and and francis in this gym pick a day come in oh we've got a frozen eric nixick mid-sentence hopefully he pops back real soon if he does not that's i will me. tell you oh there we go now we okay. got him back we had a nice. little we had a little freeze but uh I will let you go. I've I've had you for well over an hour. I appreciate the time. Before you get out of here, let people know all of. I mean, I know that there's a lot coming up because you got nine thousand fighters that you're working with. <laughs> some of the some of the highlights over the next couple months as we roll through this UFC schedule, so they can follow you, follow your athletes, and and be a part of this journey for yourself and Extreme Couture going forward. Yeah, I mean, we touched on it a little earlier, but you know, Jeremy going out to going out to um, Dublin. Um, title eliminator, if you ask me, you know, Pedro Carvalho in Dublin, I think it's a great fight. So we'll have Jeremy. And then um, in uh, March, we have a bunch of guys fighting out here in March. A Sun Sal is getting ready to fight again. Um, go out to San Jose or San Antonio with Manel, you know, and I think Manel's one of those guys in the flyweight division can make some noise. You know, he's got some, got some good things coming up. So uh, all the boys, Ty Gorder, we got some young guys that are fighting local. So go out there and help those guys out. But all in all, man, it's, I just think for me, it's, there's no off season. It's kind of keep your head down and keep grinding, but you know, filling in, filling in and spending that family time when you can, and, you know, trying to be the best coach you can at the same. Follow him on social media at Eric underscore XC MMA. Burn the boats. Give him his love. Give him his props. I appreciate you coming on, my brother. This has been fantastic. For Eric Nixick, I am E. Spencer Kite. This has been a conversation with. We'll see you next week.